Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. In this podcast, I'll help you develop a stronger sense of self, develop firmer boundaries, and also learn how to lean into the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit who can help you navigate life. I have dozens of bonus videos posted that will help you in these areas and also will help you develop stronger coping skills. In each of the program notes, there's a link where you can request a free digital book, Understanding Your Dreams, where you can find my other media, and also where you can find my books on Amazon. Just a reminder before we get into today's episode that this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to help you with your concerns. I've been a guest recently on some different podcasts where I answered questions that relate to the integration of faith and coping and different issues that come up and questions that people have. Today, I'm sharing excerpts from a lengthy interview I did with Rebecca Ann Perkins. She hosts the podcast, Truth Applied. So we talk a lot about guilt, shame, managing emotions, and misunderstandings people have about how Christianity and mental health interface. So I'm going to post links if you want to listen to the lengthy interviews. Rebecca Ann Perkins is a life coach, and I really enjoyed talking to her. So here's excerpts from that interview. Because obviously, like I'm going to, I'm going to say like God, you know, can do anything because he can, but I deeply believe that people need to reach out and ask for help. <laughs> what oh, do you, sure. What do you say to people who say, you know, um, no, I just need, I just need prayer and the Bible and anybody who need thinks they need anything else is not trusting God enough. They're not relying on God enough. They're not praying on God enough or praying to God enough, whatever, because I still hear that sometimes I still hear people mm -hmm. sometimes who say, if you just had more faith, or if you were just a Christian, you wouldn't need to reach out and ask for help. I mean, what do you say to all that? Okay. So first Thessalonians 523 says, may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord created us body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So if I have put on some weight and I think, well, I'm going to pray that this weight goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know too many people where that is the solution. Right. I have to exercise and change what I'm eating. So mm -hmm. we are body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who are struggling their spirit is fine. They're reading the Bible. They're praying, but their soul needs attention. Mm -hmm. So if your thinking is really critical, really negative, judgmental, mm -hmm. that's a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing that to ourselves, mm -hmm. how can we hear the Holy Spirit? So we are body, soul, and spirit, and all three dimensions need attention. Mm-hmm. I love that. I've never actually looked at it that way. That's very helpful. But I work with a lot of people who deal with guilt and shame. Um, what is toxic guilt? That That's a topic I think that you specialize in. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So there's there's guilt that we should have. We do something wrong. We say something bad and we get it straightened out when we apologize to the person or we confess it to God, then the Bible says mm. we're, we're clean, that we're washed clean. First John one, nine, mm. if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have a way to, to have our guilt or shame removed. And I use the example with people of going through the checkout line at a store. If when I go to the store and I'm checking out with whatever I bought, I say, how many times do you go through the checkout line? 
I only go through once. I don't get in line over and over to pay for something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if Jesus paid for our sin, it makes no sense to keep getting in the checkout line to pay for something or to say, hey, was this paid for? So first we need to know if we're living in a state of chronic guilt, if we go into a state of guilt and shame, that isn't coming from God. And some people are surprised to know that. They assume that every bit of guilt, it must be from God. Mm -mm. And that isn't what the Bible teaches either, that it says our conscience can condemn us even when the Lord doesn't. So that's where we need to look at where did I learn this attitude that I'm bad, that if I say I'm sorry, that's not good enough. So that's where we look at if there was the silent treatment or super harsh punishment growing up. Uh, usually it comes from something like that, a super critical authority figure. And so we may need to go back and first we need to identify the root, choose to forgive the person who created that environment. Mm. Maybe it was deliberate, maybe it wasn't, but it really doesn't matter because forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. Mm. So we uproot that through forgiveness Another argument I've heard from some Christians is that, you know, we don't need to talk about our childhood. We don't need to talk about our past. That's that's all head shrinking stuff that's not essential. But the way you just described it was subtle, but powerful, which is we're only talking about those things to figure out the root and uproot it. If, if it has created a spirit of condemnation in you, the power of being able to identify where that con condemnation comes from, that it's wrong that it, you know, isn't biblical and then forgiving that person for it, which really acknowledges that it was wrong, right? That has the power to really reshape a person's mind or the way the voice in their head that's been condemning them since they were a child or making them feel like, you know, saying I'm sorry isn't enough, so on and so forth. So yeah, I mean, the, the wisdom of being able to say, I'm going to pull this up by the root so that it's gone forever is really all that we're doing when we're sitting around and kind of, quote unquote, digging into the past for a bit, right? Right. So when we pretend, hey, I don't have to look at that. I think that's more fear yeah. of, I don't know what to do with this. So I'm going to pretend it isn't there. But Psalm 51 talks about the Lord wants us to know truth in our innermost being. Mm -hmm. So if there's things we're not willing to look at and they're keeping us bound, then, <laughs> then we're not, not addressing. In your, yeah, in your innermost being, you're forsaking that freedom, really. Say more about we need that the, phrase. <laughs> we need the courage to go into some of these places with the Lord. Mm -hmm. He goes with us. We don't go by ourselves. We're not going there to wallow in it. We're going there. I mean, this is sort of gross, but I use the example also of nobody likes to throw up, but if you have the flu and you feel sick mm -hmm. and you just are miserable, sometimes after you throw up, you feel so much better. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. So there are things we have to kind of purge from our souls. Yeah, I totally agree. I use that analogy all the time with my coaching clients who suppress emotions in general. Okay. They just numb out and they just move, they stay busy and they, and then all of a sudden they're anxious and they're depressed and they've got all this stuff they've swept under the rug. They don't take time to constantly and consistently, I should say, um, feel what needs to be felt and resolve their emotions. So it's all piling up and now they feel sick, you know, and I'm there you like, go. you literally have to, our emotions are not always true but they are very real, physically real. And the the process of purging them, which again, depending on how you think about that analogy, it is- Yeah, cool. even an eating disorder is yeah. sometimes is purging an emotion oh, is. that is not getting attention. Right, yep, yep. Like Maybe. the moment I feel that I have to kind of swallow something, I mean, if I do that too many times in a day, I'll get a, my, I'll get a headache. If I do it too many times in a day, sure. I'll get um, an upset stomach. Yeah. Uh, what you're describing is, is makes perfect sense. Sometimes I use an analogy of a closet. You've been shoving stuff in the closet year after year after year. 
and pretty soon the door won't close anymore and you don't know what's wrong. <laughs> right. Well, no, let me ask you, is is that because they were just raised that way? I mean, is this because yeah. people are just, you, emotions aren't important, they're too big, they're too scary, we ignore them totally? I mean, is that what's We happening? don't talk about that, yeah. We don't talk about that or, you know, pull yourself together, whatever a family might use that, well, you need to think positive. I mean, even in, even in Christian environments, it's like, well, you're, you know, that's, that's fleshly. You need Mm -hmm. to get out of that. It's like, uh, well, Jesus wept, you know? So, I mean, we're designed body, soul, and spirit. So any dimension that gets ignored is going to become a problem. But if we're raised where we don't talk about it, where you're shamed, if you're not perfect, where uh, you're weak, if you have emotion, then you're not going to value and respect yourself. And I love the idea of journaling. I really encourage people who have trouble uh, identifying, putting things into words, I encourage them to journal. And sometimes people say, well, what do I journal? And I have a very, very simple technique is I have people rate four things on a scale of one to 10. One is the best, 10 is the worst. And I ask them to rate themselves how they're doing that day in terms of depression, stress, irritability, whether it shows or not, Mm -hmm. and guilt. Mm -hmm. And so as they see, maybe they even have trouble, you know, bringing a number to it. That means you're disconnected from your emotional self, your authentic self, all those things need attention. And then if you notice one of those is high, maybe write about why that one area might be high that day. So a person begins to recognize, oh, this is falling out of the closet. Maybe I should pay attention to it. And then I can decide what to do with it as opposed to push it back in the closet. Mm -hmm. Then we unload things and we become free. Mm -hmm. The Lord wants to unpack that too. Mm -hmm. So he can restore us, but we can't be restorative things that we can't even acknowledge. Like Jesus wants to comfort. He wants to encourage. He wants to heal. And when we just swallow them, we're not giving him an opportunity to minister to our soul. Like it it seems like such a shame to me. We learn a process of how to deal with emotions. And if your parents don't know how to deal with theirs, they can't teach you what to do with yours. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just becomes an area that gets ignored or shamed. Mm -hmm. And so when people hit adulthood and they know something's wrong, but they don't know what to do about it, They don't even understand this is the process to label, talk about, think about, and then release it. People don't even get that there's a process to do this. And so that's a lot of probably what you do. It's a lot of what I do. Let's talk about it. What are, you know, Mm -hmm. what impact did that have on you? Are there still things about that that bother you? And then maybe even just talking about it, they see it differently, or I can give them a perspective. It's like, okay, well, I get why you felt rejected, but do you see how that guy is nowhere near ready for any kind of significant attachment? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't. And then it's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, yeah, that had nothing to do with you. He was not my, as my grandma would have said. He's not good enough for you, honey. Being human is very messy. And so if we think that there's something unusually wrong with us because we feel messy sometimes, or there's parts of our soul that are messy, that's what it means to be human. Until we get to heaven, there's stuff that just isn't entirely right. Mm. And so we do the best we can. We try to grow. We try to be honest. We let the Lord work on us. Um, We let him love us Mm -hmm. even when we don't feel lovable and he transforms us, but it's one step at a time. We all have things to work on. We all have areas that are wounded, that are broken, but we all have strengths and we all have gifts. So we don't want to live in the uh, 
focus on dysfunction because that can become like a preoccupation and even a, a kind of a weird sort of an idol where yes. we make mental health our idol. It's like, yes. well, any again, we don't want to focus so much on ourselves that we're yes. not really worshiping the Lord. We're not engaging in life. Mm. It's sort of a balance. There's a certain, if your arm is broken, you need to focus on getting well, but you don't want to always be focused on how you're functioning. Yes. And I have heard that as well as an argument from some people that it's too self-focused. If I just sit in the, you know, an office or pay somebody to talk about myself for an hour, how's that that's not biblical. That's not going to make me feel better, but you just nailed it. I mean, we don't even need to dive into that anymore because the whole point is, you know, working on healing yourself is different than making mental health an idol. It's different than saying all this coaching or counseling is going to save me. It's not going to save you, but it will help you. (laughs) It will help. It will give you some tools. Those are the excerpts from a lengthy interview I did with Rebecca Ann Perkins. Follow the links to find her podcast, Truth Applied, to find her website or to look into her services as a life coach. Thanks for listening. And if this helped you, share it with a friend.